American Government, the Constitution. Because our supplemental crash course video did such a great job of covering the history of the Constitution, I will spend the remainder of this section talking about the structure of the Constitution, the government it outlined and empowered, and the civil rights and liberty it provides. I encourage all of you to read the full text of the Constitution and Bill of Rights either in your textbook or in the final two links of this lecture or even follow along on your own copy as I go. No interpretation can replace the actual reading of the fairly short document yourself. The next few lectures will be focused on these three points regarding the U.S. Constitution. Structure of the Constitution, government structure and powers, and civil rights and civil liberties. This video will cover the first and most essential of these three points, the structure of the Constitution. Within this discussion about structure, I will include a summary of the contents of the Constitution. The Constitution is a fairly short document, considering its importance. Without the Bill of Rights, the Constitution contains only 4,543 words. That's about the length of a decent essay. With the amendments, it's still only 7,591 words long. For some perspective, the average thriller novel is around 100,000 words. Now, the Constitution begins with a brief preamble, followed by seven articles that each may contain several sections and clauses. The preamble to the Constitution isn't just an introduction. It's an important part of the document, and it holds as much weight as any of the articles or amendments do. Indeed, the preamble has been cited by the Supreme Court as the justification for rulings. It's so important that it is likely that many of you were asked to memorize it when you were younger in school. So let's refresh our memories as to its contents. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. There are seven articles in the Constitution following the preamble. Let's go over what these articles contain. Article one is by far the longest article in the Constitution. Earlier, I mentioned that there are 4,543 words in the original portion of the Constitution, excluding the Bill of Rights and amendments. Well, Article 1 is 2,266 words long, which is almost exactly half of the whole document. Why? Why is it so long? Many people wonder. Why is this part of the Constitution so much more wordy than the rest of it? Well, as the lawmaking body, it was viewed as the most important function of the new national government at the time. You will recall that the Articles of Confederation provided for only a Congress. So the fact that the next two articles regarding the executive and the courts even made it into the Constitution at all was a good thing. Now, this is not to say that the legislative branch of the government is the most powerful. In fact, scholars have debated over which branch of government is most powerful. And some do say that Congress is the most powerful. Many of them also argue that either of the other two branches are more powerful. Having devoted a large portion of my career to Congress, you would think that I would agree, but I don't necessarily. If I had to pick one, I would say, in my opinion, that it is the Supreme Court that is more powerful than the other two which is for another lesson, but I don't really, really believe that. I believe that all three branches are equally as powerful as one another. And since I don't have to pick one, I will tell you that we have three equal but separated branches of government so that they might balance out and hold one another accountable. 
which is what we refer to when we say checks and balances. We don't want any of the three to be more powerful than the other. We want there to be balance. Because of the amount of content that we need to cover in Article 1, this amendment, or actually this article, will take the longest to cover. So, so be patient with me. Section 1 of Article 1 of the Constitution says, All legislative powers herein granted shall be vested in a Congress of the United States, which shall consist of a Senate and a House of Representatives. Short and sweet. For some of these slides, I'm going to actually put up the actual words of the section or the clause on the slide. Unless I feel like it's too long, then I'll just leave it off and I'll do, um, I'll give you an interpretation of it. However, I, I recommend that you follow along um, this lecture with an act the actual copy of the Constitution, either from your textbook or the one that I posted online. If you could just follow along, that way you can see um, that what I'm saying when I'm paraphrasing matches up with the actual text. And the other thing you'll notice when I put up direct quotes from the Constitution, you'll notice that the grammar and the capitalization is a little bit off from modern English. Um, that's normal. You'll, I left in all of those um, grammatical differences when I when I put something up quoted. And you'll know that it's a quotation directly from the Constitution on the slide if it is italicized. All right, so moving on to section two um, about the House of Representatives. In clause one, it talks about the composition and election of members. The House of Representatives shall be composed of members chosen every second year by the people of the several states, and the electors in each state shall have the qualifications requisite for electors of the most numerous branch of the state legislature. So this means that every state has the power to decide who may vote for members of Congress. Within each state, those who may vote for state legislators may also vote for members of the House of Representatives and under the 17th Amendment for United States Senators. When the Constitution was written, nearly all of the states limited voting rights to white male property owners or taxpayers at least 21 years old. Subsequent amendments granted voting power to African American men, all women, and everyone at least 18 years old. Clause 2 of Section 2 is regarding qualifications. It says, No person shall be a representative who shall not have attained the age of 25 years and been seven years a citizen of the United States, and who shall not, when elected, be an inhabitant of that state in which he shall be chosen. An easier way of saying that, a more modern way of saying it, is that each member of the House must be at least 25 years old, a citizen of the United States for at least seven years, and a resident of the state in which he or she is elected. Section 2, Clause 3 is regarding the apportionment of representatives and direct taxes. It's a fairly wordy clause, so I will go ahead and paraphrase it for you and um, just kind of explain what it means. It basically says that a state's representation in the House is based on the size of the state's population. Population is counted in each decade's census for each state, after which Congress reapportions or spreads out House seats. Since early in the 20th century, the number of seats has been limited to 435 members. And that, you know, that's what it is today. Section two, clause four is regarding vacancies. It says when vacancies happen in the representation from any state, the executive authority thereof shall issue writs of election to fill such vacancies. In other words, um, the executive authority is referring to each state's governor. So um, when a vacancy occurs in the House of Representatives, the governor uh, has the responsibility to call a special election to fill it. Section 2, Clause 5 is regarding officers and impeachment. 
it says the House of Representatives shall choose their speaker and other officers and shall have the sole power of impeachment. Basically, this means the power to impeach is the power to accuse. In this case, it is the power to accuse members of the executive or judicial branch of wrongdoing or abuse of power. Once a bill of impeachment is issued, the Senate holds the trial. Section three of Article one is regarding the Senate. So we're moving on to a new section here. Clause one is regarding the term and number of members of the Senate. It says, the Senate of the United States shall be composed of two senators from each state chosen by the legislature thereof for six years and each senator shall have one vote. Now this part of the Constitution has since been amended. Every state has two senators still, each of whom serves for six years and has one vote in the upper chamber. Since the 17th Amendment though, was passed in 1913, all senators have been elected directly by the voters of the state during the regular election. So instead of being um, voted in by, by the House, they are now voted in by the people. Section three, clause two is regarding the classification of senators or their elections. One third of the Senate seats are open to election every two years. In contrast, all members of the House of Representatives are elected every two years. Here's how it works. A Senator's term is six years long. A Representative's term in the House is two years long. Every two years, a congressional election is held and at that election, one third of the Senators will run and every member of the House will run. Section three, clause three, is regarding qualifications. Every senator must be at least 30 years old, a citizen of the United States for a minimum of nine years, and a resident of the state in which he or she is elected. Section three, clause four, is regarding the role of the vice president. It says, the Vice President of the United States shall be President of the Senate, but shall have no vote unless they be equally divided. Basically, this says that the only time that the Vice President can be a part of the vote is if there's a tie, and the Constitution gives no other official duties to the Vice President. Section 3, Clause 5 is regarding other officers. It basically says that the Senate votes for one of its members to preside when the vice president is absent. This person is usually called the president pro tempore because of the temporary nature of the position. Section three, clause six is regarding impeachment trials. It says the Senate shall have the sole power to try all impeachments. When sitting for that purpose, they shall be on oath or affirmation. When the President of the United States is tried, the Chief Justice shall preside, and no person shall be convicted without the concurrence of two-thirds of the members present. Just to, to rephrase that, the Senate conducts trials of officials that the House impeaches. That's how it works. The Senate sits as a jury with the Vice President presiding if the President is not on trial. Section three, clause seven is regarding penalties for conviction. It states, judgment in cases of impeachment shall not extend further than to removal from office and disqualification to hold and enjoy any office of honor, trust, or profit under the United States. But the party convicted shall nevertheless be liable and subject to indictment, trial, judgment, and punishment according to law. This means on conviction of impeachment charges, the Senate can only force an official to leave office and prevent him or her from holding another office in the federal government. The individual, however, can still be tried in a regular court. 
All right, moving on. Section four is regarding congressional elections, the times, manner, and places. Clause one uh, regarding elections says that basically Congress set the Tuesday after the first Monday in November in even numbered years as the date for congressional elections. In states with more than one seat in the House, Congress requires that representatives be elected from districts within each state. Under the 17th Amendment, senators are elected at the same places as other officials. Section 4, Clause 2 is regarding sessions of Congress. It says that Congress has to meet every year at least once. The regular session now begins at noon on January 3rd of each year. Subsequent to the 20th Amendment, unless Congress passes a law to fix a different date. Congress stays in session until its members vote to adjourn. Additionally, the president may call a special election. Moving on to Section 5, regarding powers and duties of the houses. Clause 1 is regarding admitting members and quorum. It explains that each member or each chamber, excuse me, may exclude or refuse to seat a member elect. The quorum rule requires that 218 members of the House and 51 members of the Senate be present to conduct business. This rule normally is not enforced in the handling of routine matters. Section 5, Clause 2 is regarding the rules and discipline of members. It says that the House and the Senate may adopt their own rules to guide their proceedings. Each may also discipline its members for conduct that is deemed unacceptable. No member may be expelled without a two-thirds majority vote in favor of expulsion. Section 5, Clause 3 is regarding keeping a record. It says that Congress needs to keep a record of the things that happen, uh, a journal of its proceedings, and publish it. So uh, the journals of the two chambers are published at the end of each session of Congress. And oftentimes during hearings and things like that, you will hear, or even on the House or Senate floor, you'll hear members state that they just want to get something on the record. Um, oftentimes it's not to make a law or it's not really um, to have a big effect except they want to get it in the official record. Section 5 clause 4 is about adjournment. Um, it says that Congress has the power to determine when and where to meet provided however that both chambers meet in the same city. Neither chamber may recess for more than three days without the consent of the other. Moving on to section 6 regarding rights of members. Clause 1 of Section 6 is regarding the compensation and privileges of members. It um, says that congressional salaries are to be paid by the United States Treasury rather than by the members' respective states. The original salaries were $6 per day. Wow. And um, in 1857, they were $3,000 per year. Both representatives and senators were paid a base salary of $174,000 in 2012. Um, it also says in this clause that treason is defined in Article 3, Section 3. Uh, a felony is any serious crime. A breach of the peace is any indictable offense less than treason or a felony. Uh, it says that members cannot be arrested for things they say during speeches and debates in Congress. This immunity applies to the Capitol building itself and not to their private lives. Section 6, Clause 2 is regarding restrictions. It says that um, during the term for which a member was elected, he or she cannot concurrently accept other federal government positions. Moving on to Section 7, it's regarding legislative powers bills and resolutions. Clause 1 is about revenue bills. Basically, it says that all tax and appropriations bills for raising money have to originate in the House of Representatives. The Senate, though, often amends such bills and may even substitute an entirely different bill. 
Section 7, Clause 2 is regarding the presidential veto. It says that when a Congress, when Congress sends the president a bill, he or she can sign it, in which case it becomes a law, or they can send it back to the chamber in which it originated. If it is sent back, a two-thirds majority of each chamber must pass it again for it to become law. If the president neither signs nor sends it back within 10 days, it becomes law anyway, unless Congress adjourns in the meantime. Section 7, Clause 3, is regarding actions on other matters. It says that the president must have the opportunity to either sign or veto everything that Congress passes, except votes to adjourn and resolutions not having the force of law. Okay, Section 8 is about the powers of Congress. Section 8, Clause 1 is regarding taxing. It says that duties are taxes on imports and exports. Impost is the term that they use for this, and it is a generic term for tax. Excises are taxes on the manufacture, sale, or use of goods. Section 8, Clause 2, is about borrowing. It says Congress has the power to borrow money, which is normally carried out through the sale of U.S. Treasury bonds on which interest is paid. And note that the Constitution places no limit on the amount of government borrowing. Section 8, Clause 3 is the Commerce Clause. It's regarding regulation of commerce. And this Commerce Clause gives Congress the power to regulate interstate and foreign trade. Much of the activity of Congress is based on this clause. So if you're going to remember one, here's a good one to remember. Section 8, Clause 4 is regarding naturalization and bankruptcy. It says that only Congress may determine how aliens can become citizens of the United States. Congress may make laws with respect also to bankruptcy. Section 8, Clause 5 is regarding money and standards. It says that Congress mints coins and prints and circulates paper money. Congress can establish uniform measures of time, distance, weight, and the like. In 1838, Congress adopted the English system of weights and measures as our national standard instead of the metric system. Section 8, Clause 6 is regarding punishing counterfeiters. It says that Congress has the power to punish those who copy American currency and pass it off for real, otherwise known as counterfeit money. Uh, currently, the penalty may be either imprisonment for up to 15 years, plus fines, or fines. And Clause 7 uh, about roads and post offices says that post roads include all routes over which mail is carried, including highways, railways, waterways, and airways. Section 8, Clause 8 is regarding patents and copyrights. It says that authors' and composers' works are protected by copyrights established by copyright law, which currently, today, is the Copyright Act of 1976, as amended. Copyrights are valid for the life of the author or composer plus 70 years. Inventors' works are protected by patents, which vary in length of protection from 14 to 20 years. A patent gives a person the exclusive right to control the manufacture or sell of her or his invention. Another term we use for this is intellectual property. Section 8, Clause 9 is regarding the lower courts. Congress has the authority to set up all federal courts except the Supreme Court, and they have the authority to decide what cases those courts will hear. Section 8, Clause 10 is regarding the punishment for piracy. Um, it says to define and punish piracies and felonies committed on the high seas and offenses against the law of nations. I don't know why, but I just love, I love the way that's worded. It means Congress has the authority to prohibit the commission of certain acts outside U.S. territory 
and to punish certain violations of international law. Section 8, Clause 11, very important. It's about the declaration of war. It says that only Congress can declare war, although the president, as commander-in-chief, can make war without Congress's formal declaration. Section 8, uh, Clause 12, is regarding the Army, and it says that the Congress has the power to create an army. The funds used to pay for it must be appropriated for no more than two-year intervals for the military. This latter restriction gives ultimate control of the Army to civilians. Section 8, Clause 13, is regarding the creation of a Navy. Uh, it allows for the maintenance of a Navy, and in 1947, Congress created the United States Air Force. Section 8, Clause 14, is regarding the re regulation of the armed forces. Um, it says that Congress sets the rules for the military, mainly by way of the Uniform Code of Military Justice, which was enacted in 1950 by Congress. Clause 15 is about the militia. Uh, the militia is known today as the National Guard. Both Congress and the President have the authority to call the National Guard into federal service. Section 8, Clause 16 is about how the militia is organized. This clause gives Congress the power to federalize state militia or National Guard. When called into such service, the National Guard is subject to the same rules that Congress has set forth for the regular armed services. Section 8, Clause 17 establishes the creation of the District of Columbia. Um, and it was in 1791 that Congress established the District of Columbia, Washington, D.C., as the national capital. Um, Virginia and Maryland had granted the land for the district, but Virginia's grant was returned because it was believed it would not be needed. Today, the district covers 69 square miles. And last but not least in this section is Clause 18. It is the Elastic Clause. This clause, the Necessary and Proper Clause, or the Elastic Clause, grants no specific powers and thus it can be stretched to fit different circumstances. It has allowed Congress to adapt the government to changing needs and times. Section 9 is regarding the powers denied to Congress. Clause 1 tackles the question of slavery. Um, I'm just going to read it verbatim, even though it was too long to put on the slide. It says, the migration or importation of such persons as any of the states now existing shall think proper to admit shall not be prohibited by the Congress prior to the year 1808, that a tax or duty may be imposed on such importation, not exceeding $10 for each person. Now, when they say person, they use the word persons or person, that is referring to slaves. Congress outlawed the slave trade in 1808, but that didn't mean they outlawed slavery. They just outlawed the trading of slaves at that time. Section 9, Clause 2, is about habeas corpus. It states that the privilege of the writ of habeas corpus shall not be suspended unless when in cases of rebellion or invasion, the public safety may require it. What does that mean? It means that a writ of habeas corpus is a court order directing a sheriff or other public officer who is detaining another person to, quote, produce the body, unquote. That's what habeas corpus translates into. Um, they need to produce the body of the detainee so that the court can assess the legality of the detention. So habeas corpus cannot be suspended except in cases of, you know, rebellion or invasion or uh, if there's some kind of public safety issue that would require it. Section 9, Clause 3 is regarding special bills. It says, 
It's really only one sentence long. It says, no bill of attainder or ex post facto law shall be passed. <clears throat> and what that means is um, a bill of attainder is a law that inflicts punishment without a trial. An ex post facto law is a law that inflicts punishment for an act that was not illegal when it was committed. Section 9, Clause 4. It's worded kind of confusingly, but I want to read it to you nonetheless. It says, no capitation or other direct tax shall be laid unless in proportion to the census or enumeration herein before directed to be taken. Now, a capitation is a tax on a person. A direct tax is a tax paid directly to the government, such as a property tax. This clause was intended to prevent Congress from levying a tax on slaves per person and thereby taxing slavery out of his existence. Section 9, Clause 5 uh, is regarding export taxes. It says, no tax or duty shall be laid on articles exported from any state. Congress may not tax any goods sold from one state to another or from one state to a foreign country. Congress does have the power though to tax goods that are brought from other countries. Section 9, Clause 6 is regarding interstate commerce. It says Congress may not treat different ports within the United States differently in terms of taxing and commerce powers. Congress may not give one state's port a legal advantage over the ports of another state. Section 9, Clause 7 is regarding Treasury withdrawals. It says specifically, no money shall be drawn from the Treasury but in consequence of appropriations made by law and a regular statement and account of the receipts and expenditures of all public money shall be published from time to time. This means federal funds can be spent only as Congress authorizes. This is a significant check on the President's power. Section 9, Clause 8 is about the titles of nobility <clears throat> and recently um, in recent events, you may have heard of this clause as the emoluments clause. That's another, another term it goes by. It says, no title of nobility shall be granted by the United States, and no person holding any office of profit or trust under them shall, without the consent of Congress, accept of any present, emolument, office, or title of any kind whatever from any king prince or foreign state. So this means no person in the United States may hold the title of nobility, such as a duke or duchess. This clause also discourages bribery of American officials by foreign governments by disallowing government officials to profit from foreign governments, even if it's private citizens from foreign governments. Section 10 is regarding those powers denied to the states. In clause one, regarding treaties and coinage, it states, no state shall enter into a, any treaty, alliance, or confederation, grant letters of mark and reprisal, coin money, emit bills of credit, make anything but gold and silver coin a tender in payment of debts, pass any bill of attainder, ex post facto law, or law impairing the obligation of contracts or grant any title of nobility. Note that prohibiting state laws impairing the obligation of contracts was intended to protect creditors at the time. And also note Shea's rebellion, an attempt to prevent courts from giving effect to creditors' legal actions against debtors, occurred only one year before the Constitution was written. Section 10. Clause 2 is regarding duties and imports, and it basically says that only Congress can tax imports. Furthermore, um, the states cannot tax exports. Section 10, Clause 3 is about war. 
it says, no state shall, without the consent of Congress, lay any duty of tonnage, keep troops, or ships of war in time of peace, enter into any agreement or compact with another state, or with a foreign power, or engage in war unless actually invaded, or in such imminent danger as will not admit of delay. Um, you can note here that a duty of tonnage is a tax on ships according to their cargo capacity. No states may ship may tax ships according to their cargo unless Congress agrees. Additionally, this clause forbids any state to keep troops or warships during peacetime or to make a compact with another state or foreign nation unless Congress so agrees. A state, in contrast, can maintain a militia, but its use has to be limited to disorders that occur within the state, unless, of course, the militia is called into federal service. Yay! Congratulate yourself! You made it through all of Article 1, which is about the halfway point of the first part of the Constitution. So give yourself a pat on the back for not falling asleep. And we'll move on to Article Number Two, Article Two, the Executive Branch. Section One has to do with the nature and scope of presidential power, and Clause One has to do with the four-year term. It says the executive power shall be vested in the President of the United States of America. He shall hold his office during the term of four years and together with the vice president chosen for the same term be elected as follows. Um, a note here, the president has power to carry out laws made by Congress called the executive power. He or she serves in office for a four year term after election. The 22nd amendment limits the number of times a person may be elected president to two terms. Section 1, Clause 2 is about choosing electors from each state. The electors are known more commonly as the, the Electoral College. The president is elected by electors, that is, representatives chosen by the people rather than by the people directly. Section 1, Clause 3 is regarding the former system of elections. The original method of selecting the president and vice president was replaced by the 12th Amendment. Apparently, the framers did not anticipate the rise of political parties and the development of primaries and conventions. Section 1, Clause 4 is regarding the time of elections. It says the Congress may determine the time of choosing the electors and the day on which they shall give their votes, which day shall be the same throughout the United States. Congress set the Tuesday after the first Monday in November every fourth year as the date for choosing electors. The electors cast their votes on the Monday after the second Wednesday in December of that year. Section 1, Clause 5 is regarding qualifications for president. It says, no person except a natural born citizen or a citizen of the United States at the time of the adoption of this constitution shall be eligible to the office of president. Neither shall any person be eligible to that office who shall not have attained the age of 35 years and been 14 years a resident within the United States. Uh, note here, the president must be a natural born citizen he must be, or she, must be 35 years of age when taking office and have been a resident within the United States for at least 14 years. Section 1, Clause 6 is regarding succession of the Vice President. It says, in case of the removal of the President from office or of his death, resignation or inability to discharge the powers and duties of the said office, the same shall devolve on the vice president and the Congress may by law provide for the case of removal, death, 
resignation or inability, both of the president and vice president, declaring what officer shall then act as president, and such officer shall act accordingly until the disability be removed, or a president shall be elected. I'll note here that this section provided for the method by which the vice president was to succeed to the presidency, but its wording is ambiguous. It was replaced by the 25th Amendment, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Section 1, Clause 7 is regarding the president's salary. It says, the president shall, at stated times, receive for his services a compensation which shall neither be increased nor diminished during the period for which he shall have been elected and he shall not receive within that period any other emolument from the United States or any of them. Um, and it's important to note the president maintains the same salary during each four-year term, and he is allowed to now, um, or she. Moreover, she or he may not receive additional cash payments from the government. Originally, the salary was set at $25,000 per year. The salary is currently $400,000 a year, plus $169,000 in various expense accounts. Clause eight is regarding the oath of office. The president is sworn in prior to beginning the duties of the office. The taking of the oath of office occurs on January 20th following the November election. The ceremony is called the inauguration. The oath of office is administered by the Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court. Section two is regarding the powers of the president. Clause one is regarding his position as commander in chief. It says the president shall be commander in chief of the army and navy of the United States and of the militia of the several states when called into the actual service of the United States. He may require the opinion in writing of the principal officer in each of the executive departments upon any subject relating to the duties of their respective offices. And he shall have power to grant reprieves and pardons for offenses against the United States, except in cases of impeachment. Now, the armed forces are placed under civilian control because the president is a civilian, but still commander in chief of the military. The president may ask for the help of the head of each of the executive departments, thereby creating the cabinet. The cabinet members are chosen by the president with the consent of the Senate, but they can be removed without Senate approval. The president's clemency powers extend only to federal cases. In those cases, he or she may grant a full conditional, full or conditional pardon, or reduce a prison term or fine. But again, only in federal cases, not in state cases. Section two, clause two is regarding treaties and appointments. It says he shall have power by and with the advice and consent of the Senate to make treaties provided two thirds of the senators pres present concur and he shall nominate and by and with the advice and consent of the Senate shall appoint ambassadors, other public ministers and consuls judges of the Supreme Court and all other officers of the United States whose appointments are not herein otherwise provided for and which shall be established by law. But the Congress may by law vest the appointment of such inferior officers as they think proper in the president alone, in the courts of law, or in the heads of departments. Note here, many of the major powers of the president are identified in this clause, including the power to make treaties with foreign governments, with the approval of Senate by a two thirds vote, of course, and the power to appoint ambassadors, Supreme Court justices, and other government officials. Most such appointments require Senate approval. Section two, clause three is regarding vacancies 
It says that the president has the power to appoint temporary officials to fill vacant federal offices without Senate approval if the Congress is not in session. Such appointments expire automatically at the end of Congress's next term. Okay, Article 2, Section 3 is regarding the duties of the president. It says he shall from time to time give the Congress information of the State of the Union and recommend to their consideration such measures as he shall judge necessary and expedient. He may, on extraordinary occasions, convene both houses or either of them, and in case of disagreement between them with the respect to the time of adjournment, he may adjourn them to such time as he shall think proper. He shall receive ambassadors and other public ministers. He shall take care that the laws be faithfully executed and shall commission all the officers of the United States. Um, it's pretty self-explanatory. And uh, I'll say here annually, the president reports on the State of the Union to Congress, as it said here, um, he, rec they rec he recommends legislative measures um, in more common modern terms, he sets an agenda that he proposes to Congress to make happen for him, and he proposes a federal budget. The State of the Union speech is a statement not only to Congress, but also to the American people. After it's given, the president proposes a federal budget and presents an economic report. At any time, the president may send special messages to Congress while it is it's in session. The president has the power to call special sessions to adjourn Congress when it is two chamber when its two chambers do not agree on when to adjourn, to receive diplomatic representatives of other governments, and to ensure the proper execution of all federal laws. The president further has the ability to empower federal officers to hold their positions and to perform their duties. Section four is on impeachment. It says the president, vice president, and all civil officers of the United States shall be removed from office on impeachment for and conviction of treason, bribery, or other high crimes and misdemeanors. And that's it. That's all it says. You'd think for such an important um, section, it would say more, but I guess that's really all it needs to say. Or is it? This is something that's somewhat controversial uh, these days. I will note that treason denotes giving aid to the nation's enemies. The phrase high crimes and misdemeanors is usually considered to mean serious abuses of political power. In either case, the president or vice president may be accused by the House, um, called an impeachment, and then removed from the office if convicted by the Senate. Note that impeachment does not mean removal, but rather refers to an ac accusation of treason or high crimes and misdemeanors. So the impeachment would be the accusation by the House and the conviction would be by the Senate. And that is when he would be removed, or she. Okay, Article 3 is about the judicial branch. Section 1 deals with judicial powers, courts, and judges. It says, the judicial power of the United States shall be vested in one Supreme Court, and in such inferior courts as the Congress may from time to time ordain and establish. The judges, both of the Supreme and inferior courts shall hold their offices during good behavior and shall at stated times receive for their services a compensation which shall not be diminished during their continuance in office. So basically the Supreme Court is vested with judicial power as are the lower federal courts that Congress creates. Federal judges serve in their offices for life unless they are impeached and convicted by Congress. The payment of federal judges may not be reduced during their time in office. In Section 2, it is regarding jurisdiction. It says the federal courts take on cases that concern the meaning of the United States Constitution, 
all federal laws and treaties. They also can take on cases involving citizens of different states and citizens of foreign nations. Section 2, Clause 2 is regarding cases for the Supreme Court. In a limited number of situations, the Supreme Court acts as a trial court and has original jurisdiction. These cases involve a representative from another country or involve a state. In all other situations, the cases must first be tried in the lower courts and then can be appealed to the Supreme Court. Congress may, however, make exceptions. Today, the Supreme Court acts as a trial court for first instance of first instance on rare occasions. It's only about 2% of the time. Clause 3 is regarding the conduct of trials. Um, it says the trial of all crimes except in cases of impeachment shall be by jury and such trial shall be held in the state where the said crimes shall have been committed. But when not committed within any state, the trial shall be at such place or places as the Congress may by law have directed. So any person accused of a federal crime is granted the right to a trial by jury in a federal court in that state in which the crime was committed. Trials of impeachment are an exception. Section 3, Clause 3, is regarding treason. It's the definition of treason explained in Clause 1. Treason against the United States shall consist only in levying war against them or in adhering to their enemies, giving them aid and comfort. No person shall be convicted of treason unless the testimony of two witnesses to the same overt act or on confession in open court. So treason is the making of war against the United States or giving aid to its enemies. Let's see, section three, clause two is regarding punishment of treason. It says, the Congress shall have power to declare the punishment of treason, but no attainder of treason shall work corruption of blood or forfeiture except during the life of the person attained. This means Congress has provided that the punishment for treason ranges from a minimum of five years in prison and or a $10,000 fine to a maximum of death. No attainder of treason shall work corruption of blood. That that means it prohibits punishment of the traitor's heirs. So you cannot punish a son for a father's crimes. Okay, moving on to Article 4 regarding relations among the states. Section 1 is regarding full faith and credit. It says that all states are required to respect one another's laws their records, and their lawful decisions. There are exceptions, however. A state does not have to enforce another state's criminal code, nor does it have to recognize another state's grant of a divorce if the person obtaining the divorce did not establish legal residence in the state in which it was given. Article 4, Section 2 is regarding the treatment of citizens. And in Clause 1, it says um, it's about privileges and immunities. It says the citizens of each state shall be entitled to all privileges and immunities of the citizens in the several states. A citizen of a state has the same rights and privileges as the citizens of another state in which he or she happens to be. Clause two is about extradition. Uh, it says any person accused of a crime who flees to another state must be returned to the state in which the crime occurred. Article 4, Section 2, Clause 3 is regarding fugitive slaves. It says, no person held to service or labor in one state under the laws thereof escaping into another shall, in consequence of any law or regulation therein, be discharged from such service or labor, but shall be delivered up on claim of the party to whom such service or labor may be due. 
Happy to say that this clause was struck down by the 13th Amendment, which abolished slavery in 1865. Moving on to section three, it's regarding admission of states. Clause one is the process. <clears throat> new states may be admitted by the Congress into this union, but no new state shall be formed or erected within the jurisdiction of any other state, nor any state be formed by the junction of two or more states or parts of states without the consent of the legislatures of the states concerned as well as of the Congress. So only Congress has the power to admit new states to the Union. No state may be created to take territory away from an existing state unless the state's legislature so consents. Clause 2 is regarding public land and it says the federal government has the exclusive right to administer federal government public lands. Article 4, Section 4 is regarding Republican form of government. Each state is promised a Republican form of government, and that is, one in which the people elect their representatives. The federal government is bound to protect states against any attack by foreigners during or, or during times of trouble within a state. Article 5 is regarding methods of amendment. It says that amendments may be proposed in either of two ways by a two-thirds vote of each chamber or Congress at the request of two-thirds of the states. Ratification of amendments may be carried out in two ways, by the legislature of three-fourths of the states or by the voters in three-fourths of the states. No state may be denied equal representation in the Senate. Article six is regarding national supremacy there are two clauses. Clause one is regarding existing obligations. It says all debts contracted and engagements entered into before the adoption of this constitution shall be as valid against the United States under this constitution as under the Confederation. And during the Revolutionary War and the years of the Confederation, Congress borrowed large sums. This clause pledged that the new federal government would assume those financial obligations. Very nice, very nice of them. <laughs> Clause two is regarding the supreme law of the land. This is typically called the supremacy clause. It declares that federal law make, takes precedence over all forms of state law. No government at the local or state level may take, may make or enforce any law that conflicts with any provision of the Constitution, acts of Congress, treaties, or other rules and regulations issued by the President and his or her subordinates in the executive branch of the federal government. Article 6, Clause 3 is regarding the oath of office. It says every federal and state official must take an oath of office promising to support the U.S. Constitution. Religion may not be used as a qualification to serve in any federal office. And finally, we have Article 7, Ratification. It says the ratification of the conventions of nine states shall be sufficient for the establishment of this constitution between the states, so ratifying the same. This means that nine states were required to ratify the Constitution. Delaware was the first and New Hampshire the ninth. Now we're going to take a look at the Bill of Rights, which was passed immediately following the ratification of the Constitution and contains the first 10 amendments. The First Amendment is regarding the freedom of religion, speech, assembly, and petition. It says Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. Congress may not create an official church 
or enact laws limiting the freedom of religion, speech, the press, assembly, and petition. These guarantees, like the others in the Bill of Rights, which is the first ten amendments, are not absolute. Each may be exercised only with regard to the rights of other persons. The Second Amendment is about the militia and the right to bear arms. It says, a well-regulated militia, being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms, shall not be infringed. To protect itself, each state has the right to maintain a volunteer armed force. States and the federal government may regulate but not completely ban the possession and use of firearms by individuals. The Third Amendment is regarding the quartering of soldiers. It says, no soldier shall in time of peace be quartered in any house without the consent of the owner, nor in time of war, but in a manner to be prescribed by law. Before the Revolutionary War, it had been common British practice to quarter soldiers in colonists' homes. Military troops do not have the power to take over private houses during peacetime. The Fourth Amendment is regarding searches and seizures. It says, the right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated, and no warrants shall issue but upon probable cause, supported by oath or affirmation, and particularly describing the place to be searched and the persons or things to be seized. Here the word warrant means justification and refers to a document issued by a magistrate or judge indicating the name, address, and possible offense committed. Anyone asking for the warrant, such as a police officer, must be able to convince the magistrate or judge that an offense probably has been committed. The Fifth Amendment is about grand juries, self-incrimination, double jeopardy, due process, and eminent domain. The Fifth Amendment says, no person shall be held to answer for a capital or otherwise infamous crime unless on a presentment or indictment of a grand jury, except in cases arising in the land or naval forces or in the militia, when in actual service in time of war or public danger, nor shall any person be subject for the same offense to be twice put in jeopardy of life or limb, nor shall be compelled in any criminal case to be a witness against himself, nor be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor shall private property be taken for public use without just compensation. There are two types of juries. A grand jury considers physical evidence and the testimony of witnesses and decides whether there is sufficient reason to bring a case to trial. A pettit jury hears the case at trial and decides it. For the same offense to be twice put in jeopardy of life or limb means to be tried twice for the same crime. A person may not be tried for the same crime twice or forced to give evidence against herself or himself. Um, no person's right to life, limb, property, or liberty um, may be taken away except by lawful means called the due process of law. Private property taken for public use must be paid for by the government. The Sixth Amendment is about criminal court procedures. The Sixth Amendment says, in all criminal prosecution, the accused shall enjoy the right to a speedy and public trial by an impartial jury of the state and district wherein the crime shall have been committed, which district shall have been previously ascertained by law, and to be informed of the nature and cause of the accusation, to be confronted with the witness against him, to have compulsory process for obtaining witnesses in his favor, 
and to have the assistance of counsel for his defense. Any person accused of a crime has the right to a fair and public trial by a jury in the same state in which the crime took place. The charges against that person must be indicated. Any accused person has the right to a lawyer to defend him or her and to question those who testify against him or her, as well as the right to call people to speak in his or her favor at trial. The Seventh Amendment is about trial by jury in civil cases. The Seventh Amendment says, in suits at common law, where the value in controversy shall exceed $20, the right of trial by jury shall be preserved, and no fact tried by jury shall be otherwise re-examined in any court of the United States than according to the rules of the common law. A jury trial may be requested by either party at, in a dispute in any case involving more than 20 bucks. If both parties agree to a trial by a judge without a jury, the right to a jury trial may be put aside. They, could, they can waive it. The Eighth Amendment is regarding bail and cruel and unusual punishment. It says that excessive bail shall not be required, nor excessive fines imposed, nor cruel and unusual punishments inflicted. Bail is an amount of money that a person accused of a crime may be required to deposit with the court as a guarantee that she or he will appear in court when requested. The amount of bail required or the fine imposed as punishment for a crime must be reasonable compared with the seriousness of the crime involved. Any punishment judged to be too harsh or too severe for a crime is prohibited. The Ninth Amendment is about the rights retained by the people. The Ninth Amendment says, the enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people. Many civil rights that are not explicitly enumerated in the Constitution are still held by the people. The Tenth Amendment is regarding reserved powers of the states. It says, the powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution nor prohibited by it to the states are reserved to the states respectively or to the people. Those powers not delegated by the Constitution to the federal government or expressly denied to the states belong to the states and to the people. This amendment is in essence, it allows the states to pass laws under their police powers. Okay, so we've finished with the Bill of Rights. Now we're moving on into the rest of the amendments of the Constitution, Amendments 11 through 27. Amendment 11 is regarding suits against states. This was passed in 1775. The 11th Amendment says, the judicial power of the United States shall not be construed to extend to any suit in law or equity commenced or prosecuted against one of the United States by citizens of another state or by citizens or subjects of any foreign state. This amendment has been interpreted to mean that a state cannot be sued in federal court by one of its own citizens, by a citizen of another state or by a foreign country. The 12th amendment is regarding the election of the president and this amendment changed the procedure by which uh, presidents and vice presidents are elected and the ballots on which they are elected. The 13th amendment is about the prohibition of slavery and it was passed in 1865. It says, neither slavery nor involuntary servitude except as a punishment for crime whereof the party shall have been duly convicted shall exist within the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction. Section two said Congress shall have power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation. 
Um, some slaves had been freed during the Civil War, and this amendment freed the others and completely abolished slavery from the United States. The 14th Amendment is regarding citizenship, due process, and equal protection under the law, and it was passed in 1868. The 14th Amendment, Section 1, says, All persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside. No state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor deny to any persons within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. Under this provision, states cannot make or enforce laws that take away rights given to all citizens by the federal government. States cannot act unfairly or arbitrarily toward or discriminate against any person. Section two and section three, I'm going to, they're, they're, they're quite long um, in comparison to the others, so I'm going to paraphrase them. Section two, it set voting limitations, including um, setting the voting age to 21 years of age. This section and this part of this amendment was changed by the 26th amendment, saying that all adults over 18 can vote. Um, Section 3 forbade former government officials who supported the Confederacy during the Civil War to hold office again. Um, the, it limited the president's power to pardon those persons. Congress re removed this disability in 1898, and today it wouldn't mean anything anyway because um, none of those people are alive anymore. Section 4 of the 14th Amendment says... The validity of the public debt of the United States authorized by law, including debts incurred for payment of pensions and bounties for services in suppressing insurrection or rebellion, shall not be questioned. But neither the United States nor any state shall assume or pay any debt or obligation incurred in aid of insurrection or rebellion against the United States, or any claim for the loss or emancipation of any slave. But all such debts, obligations, and claims shall be held illegal and void. And Section 5 says the Congress shall have power to enforce by appropriate legislation the provisions of this article. The 15th Amendment is about the right to vote. It was passed in 1870. The 15th Amendment says the right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. The Congress shall have power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation. The 16th Amendment is regarding income taxes and it was passed in 1913. The 16th Amendment says the Congress shall have power to lay and collect taxes on incomes from whatever source derived without apportionment among the several states and without regard to any census or enumeration. This amendment allows Congress to tax income without sharing the revenue and without any regard to how many people they have. The 17th Amendment was regarding the popular election of senators, also passed in 1913. You'll recall um, in the earlier portion of the Constitution where it's uh, provided for senators to be appointed by the House of Representatives. Well, this amendment modified portions of Article 1, Section 3 that related to election of senators. Senators are now elected by the voters in each state directly. When a vacancy occurs, either the state may fill the vacancy by a special election or the governor of the state involved may appoint someone to fill the seat until the next election. The 18th Amendment was about prohibition. It was passed in 1919 
and this amendment made it illegal to manufacture, sell, and transport alcoholic beverages in the United States. It was later repealed by the 21st Amendment. The 19th Amendment is regarding women's right to vote, and it was passed in 1920 when my grandmother was eight years old. The 19th Amendment, Section 1, says the right of the citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. Section 2 says Congress shall have power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation. The 20th Amendment is known as the Lame Duck Amendment. And basically what it did was it said that all future elected terms will begin in the January following the election. And this was passed in 1933. The 21st Amendment simply repealed prohibition and this was passed in 1933 as well. The 22nd Amendment is regarding the limitation of presidential terms and it was passed in 1951. It says that no president may serve more than two elected terms. If, however, a president has succeeded to the office after the halfway point of a term in which another president was originally elected, like with the vice president taking over, then that president may serve for more than eight years, but not to exceed 10 years. The 23rd Amendment is regarding presidential electors for the District of Columbia. Washington, D.C. This was passed in 1961, and it says that citizens living in the District of Columbia have the right to vote in elections for president and vice president. The District of Columbia has three presidential electors, whereas before this amendment, it had none. The 24th Amendment is the Anti-Poll Tax Amendment, passed in 1964, and it says that no government shall require a person to pay a poll tax to vote in any federal election. The 25th Amendment is regarding presidential disability and vice president vacancies. It was also passed in 1967. The 25th Amendment, Section 1, states in case of the removal of the president from the office or of his death or resignation, the vice president shall become president. Section two says, whenever there is a vacancy in the office of the vice president, the president shall nominate a vice president who shall take office upon confirmation by a majority vote of both houses of Congress. Section three says, whenever the president transmits to the president pro tempore of the Senate and the Speaker of the House of Representatives, his written declaration that he is unable to discharge the powers and duties of his office, and until he transmits to them a written declaration to the contrary, such powers and duties shall be discharged by the Vice President as Acting President. Section 4 says, whenever the Vice President and a majority of either the principal officers of the executive departments or of such other body as Congress may by law provide, transmit to the President pro tempore of the Senate and the Speaker of the House of Representatives their written declaration that the President is unable to discharge the powers and duties of his office, the Vice President shall immediately assume the powers and duties of the office as acting President. It goes on to say that when the President believes that she or he is then able to carry out her or his duties again that she or he shall so indicate to Congress. However, if the vice president and a majority of the cabinet do not agree, Congress must decide by a two-thirds vote within three weeks who shall act as president. The 26th Amendment is regarding the 18-year-old vote. It was passed in 1971 and it changed the voting age from 21 to 18. And the 27th Amendment is regarding congressional pay, and it was passed in 1992. It states that no law varying the compensation for the services 
of the senators and representatives shall take effect until an election of representatives shall have intervened. And I'd like to note that between amendments 26 and 27, the last two, there was a 21 year gap in time between constitutional amendments and another 26 years since the last amendment was passed in 1992. Why do you think this is so? Just a rhetorical question, a little food for thought. Wow, that was a lot of information. But now you know exactly what's in the Constitution. Make sure you take a break between this video and the next to help you better absorb and retain all of the information. Next, we're going to talk about the structure of the government that the Constitution provides. 